You're starting a new year, and it's a new sense, and I have a sense that there is within me at least a longing for new life in Christ. How about you? So uh, join me as uh, we sing this together, New Life in Christ. You'll remember it from last year. Singing together. <clears throat> New life in Christ, abundant and free. What glory shine, what joys are mine, what wondrous blessings I see. My past with its sin, the searching and strife, Forever gone, there's a bright new dawn, for in Christ I have found new life. This is the challenge that God has for us for this new year. And I pray that he'll be with us every step of the way. I was inspired as I was uh, reading scripture this, uh, in preparation for this uh, sermon. And... Um, you know, I find it exciting when I read an old, old story in the Bible. And I then discover something that uh, just jumps out like brand new. Have you ever had that experience? Like an old, old story and then something is just fresh and new about it. I always thought this story is about money. The one that Rose read to us from Mark chapter 10. Uh, money? Money? until the Holy Spirit revealed something else, something deeper, something that, um, a truth that, that got me excited. I want to challenge you, and uh, as we study together, that you see if you can find the same, have the same experience as, as I'm ha I had as we study this portion in Scripture together. So, what are we looking at? The story is about a young man, and you can open your Bibles to Mark 10 because we can just uh, remain there for a, during the sermon, who seems to have it all together. Don't you just hate it when somebody has it all together? Because I'm floundering around the place. How dare you have it so perfect? Um, this young guy was had probably the best education, Ivy League University graduate, He's handsome, he's good-looking, he's already made his millions in a very successful career, and he's only in his early or later 20s, say. What would motivate him to approach a rabbi with a question that indicates doubt about his own perfection? What would motivate him to doubt his own perfection. Was he missing something? Was there something lacking that this young man sensed within him? If you walk down any big U.S. city today, you may see very handsome and beautiful people. I've seen them. I'm sure you have. Like those portrayed on the big screens of Hollywood. You know, they look so perfect. You feel like walking up to them and ask, are you really as flawless as you look? At the risk of being slapped or punched in the face. But if they were honest, they would say, huh, no, no. We've just covered up our blemishes with makeup. It's all just makeup. If you come close to somebody, you would see marks and imperfections, and sometimes you're the only one who knows about them because you see them each morning when you look in the mirror. Even though this rich and very successful young man seem to have it all together, he still approaches this respected rabbi they call Jesus, 
just to be very sure that he has dotted every I and crossed every T on his road to the kingdom. And so in verse 17 he says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, by addressing Jesus, who in his mind was probably a common rabbi, I don't think he gives an indication that he thought of Jesus as being the Messiah or the Son of God. But he comes to him and he says, Good teacher. By addressing him as good, he's implying that he believes that a person can be morally good or perfect. If a person was known to be good, if a person was known to be a good person, he was ready for translation. All others had flaws, like me. The Jews believed that if a person were morally good, then God would bless him with wealth and health. And this was the advice of Job's three friends, if you remember. The poor and the sick, the lame and the lepers, were under God's curse because of their sin and their immoral behavior. Implication? By doing something, I can earn my salvation. I must just do it well. Now, there's a flaw in this sentence, good teachers, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Can you inherit, can you earn or work for an inheritance? Not likely. An inheritance is usually a gift. It's a gift. You don't work for it, it's a gift. Jesus reveals the foundational flaw in Jewish belief about salvation. I mean to say, good teacher, he's already failed the test by saying good. Secondly, what must I do indicates another flaw in good the scriptural theology, and that is behavior can do something if I do something. In fact, the same story of the rich young ruler in Matthew says, not good teacher, what must I do? <clears throat> it says, good teacher, what good thing must I do? What good thing, what good deed, <clears throat> what good behavior? It's something that I can do to earn salvation. And the third flaw is that it's an inheritance, to inherit eternal life. He didn't say to gain eternal life. He didn't say to have or to receive eternal life. He said to inherit. And I looked that up. That is the Greek word there. It's inheritance. It's an inherited. Three mistakes in that one, uh, in that one sentence as he approached Jesus that reveals to Jesus where this rich young ruler was at. Verse 18, why do you call me good? Jesus immediately latches on to the very first floor. Only God is truly good. In other words, Jesus is saying, no human being is really good. It's only God who is good. Wow. What is the implication? Jesus reveals the flaw in Jewish belief about moral goodness. They believe that a person could be morally good by keeping the law. If you asked a rabbi during that time, he would say, yep, keep the statutes. Keep the law of Moses, the Torah. You do that, and you're, you're good. Jesus is saying, no. No man can obtain moral goodness by his good deeds or behavior. Paul says, for no one can ever ma uh, be made right with God by doing what the law commands. That's Romans 3 verse 20. Paul says it straight, no one can ever be made right with God or be made righteous by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows how sinful we are, right? Look at verse 19. And to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not false uh, testify falsely, you must not cheat anyone, honor your father and your mother. 
why is Jesus now referring to the law when he knows that it's not the law that's going to save you because this man wants to know how to inherit eternal life and it's not the law. Why does Jesus refer to the law? Because that was expected of every good rabbi. Jesus is really trying to test the waters of this very brilliant young Ivy League graduate's thinking on what is the custom of the time. And the custom of the time says, keep the law, you made it. Keep the law, it's good. Hmm. Jesus says, if you repent of your bad deeds and become a good moral person, you have just become a religious person, not a saved person. That ma makes sense? Jesus is trying to say to him, yeah, have you kept the law? The law is important. Just keep the law. But if you focus on the law as a behavior, you become a good religious person, but not a saved person. Look at verse 19. To answer your question, now Jesus comes back. You see, he was just testing the water. Now he comes back to his question. He says, to your question, uh, uh, you know the commandments. You must not murder, and you must not commit adultery, and steal, and falsely testify, and so forth. Why does Jesus refer to the law? Because he wants to point out that there is a real flaw in the Jewish way of thinking about the law. Remember the guy who is speaking to him is a rich young ruler, well-trained and well-respected within the religious community of Judaism. Jesus is saying, you can't keep the law without knowing the lawgiver. And you can't know the lawgiver without accepting his sacrificial gift on the cross. And bing, a little light went up for me. Look at verse 20. Teacher, the man replied, I have obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Hmm. Meaning, I've obeyed them in a strict and disciplined manner of behaving, like a little tin soldier obeying the commandments of my superior officer without thinking or questioning. Where was my attention? On myself, of course, my behavior. And I was just following the command and doing what I was supposed to. Is it possible, think with me, is it possible that we too may say or even subtly think that our good behavior and example as a good husband how many good husbands do we have here wives i hope my wife's going to put her hand up yeah ah yeah uh, yeah we've got good husbands here <laughs> is it possible or even to subtly think that our good behavior and example as a good husband or a good wife i've got a good wife or a good parent, employee, or a student is worth something and that it makes me feel that I deserve something good from God? Don't you sometimes think that or feel that? I'm a good person. I deserve something good from God. Hmm. I deser deserve at least a measure of health and success in my work. I can't understand it, Lord. I can't get work. I can't get a job. I don't know what's happening. I'm doing everything else right. Isn't this the way we think? My daughter is ill. My husband, my spouse is ill. And I'm praying and I'm saying, Lord, what am I doing wrong? He's, she's not improving. It's not, she's not getting better. What am I doing wrong? And I look back and I'm focused on my behavior and I'm saying, Lord, I'm doing everything right. Why isn't this happening? I'm kind to animals, I'm helpful when asked, I'm kind to the needy, I support a ASAP, I'm a Christmas tree, respectfully, uh, I'm a respectful and a just uh, 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 and a decent good person, I'm just a regular good man, Lord. 
Sounds like you believe in karma. Karma. Do you know what karma is? What you give comes back to you. Is that what the Bible teaches? The Bible doesn't teach that. Is that, however, inherently part of our thinking? If I'm a good person, and I think of this here, and I have good New Year's resolutions, I'm going to be a good person. And if I'm a good person, good will come to me. That's karma. That's a Hinduistic New Age belief karma. That's not Bible teaching. Hmm. Wow. We may be using our goodness to feel superior to others and to get them to do the things we want them to do. I'm an elder. I'm a deacon. I'm a ministry leader. I'm a this. I'm a that. I teach a Sabbath school lesson. We may point out our good things and our attainments and say to God, Lord, look um, what I've accomplished. You owe it to me to answer my prayers. Please do it now. We may use our good things to get control of God and of people. And it's so subtle that is it possible that even Seventh-day Adventist Christians could sometimes fall in that trap? and think that way? Is that possible? Jesus is wanting to turn this young man's attention away from behavior to what? To a relationship with himself, not only as the lawgiver, but also the one whose character of love is displayed in the law. Let me say that again. Jesus is wanting to turn his attention away from behavior to a relationship with him, not only as the lawgiver, but also as the one whose character of love is displayed in the law. It's not either or. You love me and you throw away the law. That's how people sometimes say, you know. Well, if I don't like what the law says, then I just say, oh no, the law was put on the cross, you know, nailed to the cross or something. I do away with the law. Jesus isn't about to do away with the law when he rec we recognize that the law is the transcript of his character. He can't do away with himself. He wouldn't exist, right? So why would he do away with his own principles of love? Wow. Look at verse 21. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done. Matthew's account, 19, 21, says, if you want to be perfect. There's still one thing you haven't done. There's still one thing you haven't done in order to be perfect. Why is it so hard for perfect people to be saved? Why is it so hard for God to save a perfect person like Pastor Joubert? It's hard. And he told him, go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and have a relationship with me. Follow me. Follow me. Why did Jesus not just say, come follow me? Like he said to Peter and the other disciples. Why did he meddle in all this giving away of your stuff? Oh, Lord, why did you have to go there? I would have followed you gladly. Why did he have to add possessions in there? Because he knew that the common belief was that possessions and wealth indicated moral worthiness. That you were a good person and therefore blessed by God. Jesus knows that before I can have a relationship with him, I first need to clear the clutter that separates me from him. I must first give up my goodness based on law-keeping before I can enter into a relationship with the lawgiver. You get that? I must first give up my goodness based on law-keeping before I can enter in. I give up my goodness? The Lord wants me to be good. Do I have to become bad? No. But I need to give up my goodness that I base on law-keeping before I can enter into a relationship with the lawgiver. 
Jesus is saying to the rich young ruler, you have put your wealth, your faith in your wealth and accomplishments. But the effort is alienating you from God. Right now, God is your boss, but God is not your Savior. You say you are keeping the commandments, but you don't realize that you are breaking the very first one to have no other gods before me. Your goodness and your money is your God. Something has taken your attention away from me, Jesus says. Jesus is saying to this rich young ruler, I want you to imagine life without money. I want you for a moment to imagine that yourself, as I'm imagining this right now. Imagine yourself without money. Imagine all of it is gone. The bank is burnt down. Your house is burnt down. Your car is burnt. There's no money, no, no checkbook in the car, nothing. Your wallet is no longer there. It's gone. Everything is gone. No bank account, no property, no inheritance, no servants, no mansions. All of that is gone. All you have is me. Can you live like that? Can you live like that? Stripped of everything? Can you live like that, Pastor Joubert? Can you live like that? We're standing at the beginning of a new year. How much baggage have you and I carried over from last year into this new year? Look at verse 22. At this the man's face fell and he went away sad, for he had what? Many possessions. The same Greek word here used for sad is used for is, is also translated as distress or anguish in other places like when Jesus play, prayed in the garden of gethsemane and added my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death that's the type he didn't just wander away sad jesus says sell all your stuff oh why did he have to say that he didn't just do that jesus tells him i want you to get rid of everything that is cluttering up your life making a barrier between you and me. Everything, your habits, everything you regard as important to you. Do away with it all. And the guy turns around, around and the same word, he experiences the same feeling that Jesus experienced in Gethsemane. Do you get that? Not just sad. Anguish, distress. When Jesus told him there's a T or one little dot that you have not dotted yet, he's in anguish and deep distress. His soul is crushed. He's depressed. Jesus knew he was about to experience the, the ultimate separation in Gethsemane. As the theologian Timothy Keller puts it, he was about to lose the joy of his life the core of his identity. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he realized he was about to lose everything. The core of his identity, his connection with his Father, that was it. And he cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The anguish of this loss nearly crushed him and broke him right there. God sends the angel Gabriel to strengthen him. Verse 23 to 27, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? I would like to add in there, how hard is it for a perfect person to enter the kingdom of God? This amazed them. Because why? They thought that rich people are blessed because they are good. Poor people, they sin. That's why they're poor. Jesus said, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not easy. It's hard. Why? Because salvation is hard. 
No. Jesus offers salvation freely. I don't even have to pay for it, right? It's, 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 just, it's a gift. Just take it. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they said. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not for God. Everything is possible with God. Now, if we were to respond to Jesus' statement about the rich not entering heaven, we would have most likely responded in our society today, like, good deal, Jesus. Now there will be justice at last. The rich will get their due reward. He's rich, why? Because he cheated and he did this and he did that. That's how we would maybe respond. But that was a different culture. Their culture was if you were rich, you were good. In our culture, if you're rich, you're not always good. Nasty old guy. He's a miser. He just holds on to his money. Do you see the difference? Your belief in the culture of the society in which you live would indicate your response to what Jesus said. So when the young man heard this, he turns away and he's sad. And the people can't understand this and his disciples can't understand this. This is a good man, Jesus. He's rich. He's blessed. God has blessed him. He's good. We know that. He's not a bad, he's not a thief, he's not a killer. He keeps the law, he keeps the commandments. He's a good person. Huh. In Jesus' day, where the Jews equated riches with God's blessings for moral good, good moral behavior, no wonder the disciples were so amazed and aghast. So the topic is not just about riches. It's primarily about goodness, morality, and being saved. It is not just about the rich man's financial worth. It's about his moral worth. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's, he didn't come there and say, good teacher, how can I earn more money? Jesus turned the thing towards money here at the end. Why? He simply used it as a catalyst and an example for this young man to understand exactly what it is that's causing his moral goodness to be so immoral. Something wasn't squaring. It is not, not about the rich man's financial worth. It's about his moral worth. Jesus is saying it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a good man to satisfy the law. That's what he's really saying. When I read some statements Jesus made like, be perfect as your Father is in heaven is perfect. You've heard those statements, that statement in Scripture, right? You've read it. I too respond with, who in the world can then be saved? Because I'm not perfect. Why is it so hard for a good or perfect person to be saved? I need to turn to Jesus and to Paul two of my fa favorite writers and authors in, in Scripture, to answer that question. Firstly, we go to Matthew 5, verse 20. Here is one of those tough Scriptures that speaks to this point. When Jesus says, But I warn you, Matthew 5, verse 20, I warn you, unless your righteousness, your goodness is better than the goodness or righteousness of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What? Unless my goodness and righteousness is better than their goodness and their righteousness. But Lord, they are so good, they're up there. I am just a little uh, person attending Mac Church. I'm not as righteous as Pastor Jubert. And you telling me I need to be better than he? Not that he is that good. He has no goodness within himself. But do you see the comparison? I, 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 Lord, how can this be? How can this be? Wow. The answer I find to 
Matthew 5.20 is given by Paul in Romans 10 verse 3. Unless your righteousness is better than righteousness of the Pharisees, says Jesus in Matthew 5, in Romans 10, verse 3, Paul says, for they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. They don't understand the way, God's way, of making people righteous or making people good. Yeah, God makes people good, and he has a way, and we don't understand that. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. There it is. Verse 4, For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. There's John 3.16 by Paul. All who believe in him has already been made right and righteous. Here's a second uh, tongue twister, a little tough text here in uh, Matthew. Matthew 5, still Matthew 5. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus threw out some real challenge, strong challenges to the Jews. The first one was Matthew 5.20. Now we're looking at Matthew 5.48. We've already quoted it or referred to it. Matthew 5.48 but you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. How many of you have been stymied by that in the past? I have. Be perfect as your, heaven and father, uh, your Father in heaven is perfect. How do I do that, Lord? Jesus says you must be perfect. He doesn't say try or strive to be perfect. He says you must be perfect. Yet he says only God is good or perfect. Isn't that what he said to the rich young ruler? Now how can God expect me to be good when he says, only God is good, not you, not, none, no man is perfect. I found the answer in Hebrews 10 verse 14. Paul again, in this case, answers this troubling question I have in my mind. How can I be perfect like God is perfect? And yet... God doesn't excuse me. He doesn't lower the barrier. He says, yes, you must be perfect. Hebrews 10, 14 answers that for me. For by that one offering, He forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Who is the He? Jesus Christ. For by that one offering, we, He, He, Jesus, forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Are you being made holy daily? I hope so. What offering? It says by one offering. What was the offering? Verse 12, just before, a little up before that. Hebrews 10, 12 says, But our high priest, who is that? Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for, how long? All time, forever. Jesus Christ gave himself as an offering, and by giving himself as an offering, he made Jimmy perfect, Chuck perfect. He made Brandon perfect, and Debbie perfect, and Mikey perfect. God made every one of us perfect. How? Not by me, by my law keeping, but by his sacrifice on the cross. Have, are you discovering already? Are you getting excited like I was? Man, I was so excited when I saw that and it broke through and I said, Lord, I, I didn't realize that the rich young ruler is really speaking to me. I'd read over it often and say, that's not me. I'm not rich. I don't, I don't fall in his problem. I don't have his problem. Thank you. I've got a different toe ache, but I haven't got his stomach ache. No, he's, he's got another problem. I realized I do have this problem. And I need to find the true source of my perfection. You and I can be perfect. And the only way to be perfect is to accept the gift of Jesus Christ and His sacrifice on the cross for my sin. Wow! So, why is it so difficult to save perfect people? Why is it so difficult? 
Firstly, because no behavior or amount of goodness can atone for my sins. Secondly, because I need to give up all, even my goodness, achievements, and identity. Wow! And accept His sacrifice on the cross in order to gain His goodness, His achievements, and a new identity in Him. New life in Christ, abundant and free. That's what He's calling me to do. He's calling you to do. That is an, <clears throat> there's another, uh, wait a bit, um, uh, over there in John 1, 12. You remember that? Jesus says, those who believe in him, he gave the right to be children of God. That's the new identity. I'm now a child of God. There's another amazing example in, in Mark 12. So we were looking at Mark 10, but in Mark 12, just briefly, there's another example of a teacher of the law. You know what teachers of the law were in, in, in the Bible? Scribes, teachers of the law, they were Jewish theologians. They studied the law intently. So there was another Jewish theologian in Matthew 12, uh, 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 Mark 12. Uh, there, verse 33. And he came to Jesus and said, uh, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God and love your fellow man with all your heart, mind, soul, etc., and uh, this, this same guy, he says uh, in Mark 12, who was a teacher of the law, was somebody that Jesus commended. Very few religious leaders in Jesus' time that Jesus had a good word for. He is one of them. I never realized that he had good words for Pharisees or theologians of his time. Here's one. Why? Why did he have a good word? What did he say? In Mark 12, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God, in verse 34. Because he understood what Jesus was saying, that having a relationship with God and others is more important than rule-keeping behavior. How did he say this? Let's read it there. Verse 33, Mark 12, 33. And I know, says this theologian, he's speaking now, this Jewish theologian speaking to Jesus. And I know that it is important to love him with all my heart, with all my understanding, and all my strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required by the law. Wow! This Jewish guy got it! And Jesus looks at him, and I bet Jesus was amazed his mouth may have fallen open. Wow! You are a Jewish theologian? And this lesson that I've been trying to get through to people since I preached on the Mount, uh, you know, my sermon, is not going through to the Jewish mind. And here's a Jewish theologian who shows that he gets it. Verse 34, realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Wow! Wow! If only the rich young ruler had understood this, what this Jewish uh, theologian understood, maybe he would have accepted Jesus' offer and not been grieved and not walked away. So, how does the story of the rich young ruler teach us about the cross? And there's where the penny dropped for me. If you asked me previously, okay, is the cross in the story of the rich young ruler? I said, no, I don't see it there. Where does the cross feature in the story of the rich young ruler? Six points. Number one, grace flies in the face of all one's merits. And it's our merits, our moral worth that keeps us from understanding the cross. Tonight, we're going to sit at a table in the hall and we're going to experience the symbolism of Jesus' bread, body and his blood as we partake in the communion service. We're going to wash each other's feet and we're going to come together in fellowship. There's not going to be time to preach a sermon tonight. This is it. This is it. You didn't know that. This is in preparation for this evening. 
Jesus, number two, was the ultimate rich young ruler. He was young. Jesus was about 31, 32 years old, maybe a few years older than this young guy. He was probably about 28, so Jesus was about four or five years older than him. He was rich. Jesus was rich. He made the earth and owns the gold and silver and the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all his. He is also a ruler to him that his father said, I give all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew uh, 28, verse 18. Jesus was the ultimate rich young ruler. Thirdly, Jesus says, I'm giving it all away. Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8 said, He did not remain up there with all his riches. He gave it all away. He gave it up. He gave it up for you, for me. He left it up there. And he came down to this earth. To what? To ungrateful, unthankful human beings like Pastor Jumeir. Who if I lived there, I would have joined the theologians maybe and shouting crucify him. And watched as those nails were pounded through his hands. Jesus says, I'm giving it all away. Why? For you. Second Corinthians 8 verse 9 for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that through, though he was rich, Jesus was the rich young ruler, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You, brothers and sisters, me, we are rich. We can become rich in him because he became poor for us. He gave it all away. Point number four, now you give everything and follow me. You give everything away. Timothy Keller, again, he in interprets Jesus' words like this. He says, if I give my all to get you, if I give my all to get you, can you give your little all you follow me? I like that. If I gave my big all, can you give your little all? Number five, does what Jesus did for you on the cross move you? Does it touch you? When that begins to really move you, amaze you, make you weep, then there's a chance that you will discover and start to experience the power of a cross. Letting Jesus' sacrifice melt away your merits of goodness, Pastor Jaber. Letting Jesus' sacrifice melt away your self-importance, your status, your good reputation, your honor and position in church and society will give you a whole new freedom and a joy in loving God and others that you never knew before. Wow. And then lastly, Jesus, as the rich young ruler, the real rich young ruler, came after you by giving up all he had in order to gain you as his son and as his daughter. Does the gift he gave to you on the cross <clears throat> evoke a response in your heart to give him a gift, yourself? If in this new here, the story of the rich young ruler has become applicable to you in a way that uh, maybe you've never thought of before, like I haven't, and it's challenging your heart to give up all. And you want to respond, then would you stand with me and say, Lord, I want to 
follow you. I, I want to experience the, the gift of what your cross has presented to me. I want to follow you. I truly want to allow your Holy Spirit to point out the sins and the bad habits in my life. I'm just a struggling sinner. I'm no, no good. There's no goodness in me. And I hope none of you standing here thinking that, oh, well, I'm better than so-and-so that is sitting down or not standing. Or I'm better than so-and-so who's standing. And why is she standing? She shouldn't be. You know? It's none of that. We all, without goodness before him and all in need of the cross to cleanse us, change us, make us new people. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I ever love and trust him when his presence daily lives. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. And now may the love of God, this wonderful amazing gift on the cross that Jesus gave to us. The power of the Holy Spirit be with us until Jesus comes and takes us home. <laughs>